that I intend to speak about tonight is the greatest sermon ever. And that um, is not a reference to me, <laughs> but it's a reference to the one who gave it. Basically, if I'm asked by someone who maybe doesn't know uh, basically what, what did Yeshua teach? What was his message really all about? I believe, uh, as many do who study the Bible, that you could refer to the Sermon on the Mount. And that, more than anything else, expresses the, the basic teaching that Yeshua brought to the world. And it's found in Matthew 5 to 7 in the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew 5, 1, uh, you see that uh, it's called the drosh on the mountain in Hebrew. Now when Yeshua saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So it's, it's a key moment in his ministry because uh, people were starting to be gathered to him. And they wanted to know what this thing was all about and what was it that he really had to say. And But the reason that I say that this sermon sums it all up better than anything is because, for one thing, it's a message of universal truth. Uh, it's... It expresses a principle of truth that anyone from any faith or religion or nationality can and probably will agree with, uh, regardless of what they might think about a man who was Jewish named Yeshua who lived 2,000 years ago. And obviously, we in Messianic Judaism believe that he is the Son of God and the Messiah. But, but even if you put all that aside and just look at what he taught, because obviously lots of people in the world don't believe that uh, about him, but, but, would, but they would still agree with the universal principle of his message as expressed in that particular moment. That's called the Drash al-Hahar, or the Sermon on the Mount, because it addresses and answers a simple question of what it means to be something that practically everyone is interested to be happy, happy, or as some of the uh, interpretations translate it, blessed, blessed, or blessed, which, you know, it's just a different translation of the Hebrew word ashrei, which is, can mean happy or blessed. It's really expressing the same thing because happy people know they're blessed and blessed people are happy. To boil it down, this sermon could be called the Here's How to Be Blessed Sermon. The Sermon on the Mount, or the Sermon of How to Be Blessed, <laughs> quite simply, in a nutshell, is based on this same principle that Moses wrote in the Torah from Leviticus 19, Verse 18, it's stated a little differently there, but it says, you're not to take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but the haftalrecha kamocha, and we said that earlier in the service when we did the ahafta prayer, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's an important 
principle of the Torah. And but Yeshua took it to another level. Because the way that he presented it is this is not going to be applied only to your kinsmen, as it says uh, in the verse from Leviticus, you should not bear a grudge against the children of your people, love your neighbors yourself, but it's not going to be applied only to your kinsmen, only to your um, your your own people, but as Yeshua presented it, what good is it if you love only those who love you? If you love only those who are family to you? He says it in a way that we who are happy, we who are blessed, must apply love your neighbor to all mankind. Which implies that there is this thing that we could call the brotherhood of man or uh, the family of man. That's taking it to a level that goes a lot further. He even goes so far as to say, Matthew 5, 43, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. As I said, it, it, it encompasses three chapters as it's recorded there in the book of Matthew, but he's really saying generally the same thing throughout. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He's ratcheting it up to a level not only that there's the brotherhood of man that we should that we should love our fellow man as our brother without regard to whether he is our kinsman or not but moreover he's saying even love your enemies pray for those who hate you and persecute you what kind of teaching is this and moreover who can do it and first, I would say, no one can completely. But secondly, I would say, the more that we do it, the more we're blessed. And the more we're happy. Because this is the wisdom for how we overcome evil. Resist not evil, but overcome evil with good. This means that we who are blessed are to look at humanity as our own family. Even though there clearly are people out there who don't see it that way. <laughs> even some who are incredibly evil and will even do sick things to cause harm to make a statement about their particular brand of hatred. Still, the people who are blessed, the people who are happy, are the people who see it the way that Yeshua presented it on the mount, who Consider all mankind as the family of man, even those who don't see it that way, even those who hate as hard as it is. And that we should treat all people as we would ourselves want to be treated. The narrative of the New Testament says, that Yeshua had just started going about the land, speaking in the synagogues. <clears throat> he would go into the synagogues. The synagogues, as you know, have uh, a routine. You know, there's an order to it. There's, there's a liturgical order. There's a certain prayers. We do a lot from here. The Amidah, now it's time. Please rise together as we say the Shema. 
and we face Jerusalem. I don't know if they faced Jerusalem in his day. <laughs> Maybe they did, but they probably said the Shema and a lot of these same prayers, and the Torah was read. And, and but you know, and he would go into the synagogues, and, and and then he'd have an opportunity to speak sometimes, apparently. And boy, did he rock their world. And not only that, not only with his incredible message giving, but he, and, it, and it's written of Yeshua that he spoke as one who had authority. He didn't speak as the other rabbis spoke. He didn't speak as like uh, someone, you know, who is seminary trained and they just sound like everything they're saying is stuff that they learned in an institution or in a book, not, not that there's anything wrong with being seminary trained, but, but, it's, but he spoke as one who not only had a greater wisdom and understanding of the scriptures, but who had authority. And that's something that can't be taught, not even in the greatest institutions. And the other thing that he did was he healed people. And when the word got out that there was this amazing teacher, this amazing rabbi, and people were being healed, uh, quickly people started to gather unto him. And the question was arising, you know, Maza, you say in Hebrew, you know, you go to Israel, you hear, you hear that all the time because Israelis are so kind of in your face. Uh, the Israelis are very aggressive and, and, and confrontational, but in, in a nice way. It seems confrontational to us, but it's, per, it's perfectly normal to them. And, and you'll hear the expression often, Mazet, what is this? <laughs> and naturally they were saying this. Of, what is the meaning of this, this thing that you're doing? So Yeshua proceeded to withdraw himself to a mountain and people who really wanted to know were gathered there. And he'd already been going around saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But what in the world does that mean? Why is that? Well, now he's going to say fundamentally what this message of the kingdom of heaven is all about and how one can participate in it. And he's, he begins this sermon with this amazing word, Ashrei, Matthew 5, verse 2 through 6. Ashrei, which means, as I said, happy or blessed, if you prefer. Blessed are the poor. And see, it's just the opposite of what you would think. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, the He's right off him, and he, most of these people that are gathered into him are broken, downtrodden. It's a hard time for the Jewish people. They're being overrun by the Romans. You know, and this is a persecuted people. And on the minds of many of the people was, when will Messiah come and deliver us from this and restore the throne of David as promised? and liberate Israel from foreign rule and set up a government from Jerusalem, the increase of which there will be no end, an everlasting reign of a king who will live forever and usher in peace and harmony and love throughout the earth. People will beat their swords into plowshares and study war no more. The scriptures bear witness to this. They thought that was the time, and in a way they were right, because salvation came in the very name. Salvation is Yeshua. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall 
B, satisfied. So the sermon, the greatest sermon ever given, the one which Yeshua's basic message all boils down to, addresses in particular all those who are suffering. And what he tells them is good news because this kingdom of heaven on earth thing is going to be easier for them to receive than for the rest of the world. The blessed people, the really blessed people, and it's not to say that it can't be anyone, it can be, but the really blessed people are the broken, the poor in spirit, the oppressed, the mourning, the suffering. Why is that? Because I think that the scripture in the Psalms expresses it best that um, a broken and a contrite spirit he will not despise. There's something about when human beings are in a state of brokenness and, and we have no answers and we can't even explain that we are more open to receive this basic message of the Lord. When the Jews came pouring in to the U.S. about 120 years ago, as my family did, and most Jews in the United States, not all, but most, uh, came from Eastern Europe, from the Pale of Settlement, which extends from Poland all the way down to uh, the Black Sea. And uh, our people there lived uh, in poverty, and it was a hard life. It was cold, we couldn't live in the cities, and, and they, they came pouring into the U.S., escaping the pogroms, with little more than the shirts on their backs. This was a people who had nothing to lose. After centuries of poverty and oppression and shtetls, thank God, as a people generally, generally, Jews have done well in America. And this is a principle that we see with the Jewish people historically, that when Jews have a little freedom, we tend to prosper. We tend to have good times, happy times, prosperous times. And you see Jews rise to uh, prominent places, doctors and lawyers and musicians and scholars in the universities and uh, and on and on. And as soon as that happens, haters arise who want to take it away. Anti-Semitism is one of many forms of hatred in the world, but it's unique and history is laced in a, in a, a disproportionate way with anti-Semitic hate and, and including anti-Semitic hate crimes. It's, it's unique in that the Jewish people are the people of God. The Jewish people are the people of Yeshua himself. Even though I can't stress enough, as I say all the time, he came for all people. He loves all people the same. Let us not forget that he came as a Jew and God has a a plan for the Jewish nation. He used the Jews to bring the good news to the rest of the world, and, and on and on. This is not a night to get into all that, as I often do, but, you know, that, that needs to be said. Um, and it's an odd thing, because there's something about Jews, as long as they're impoverished and miserable, it's okay, but as soon as Jews begin to do well, Somebody rises up and wants to take it away. After the Holocaust, as Jews poured into Eretz Yisrael in fulfillment of a 4,000-year-old prophecy, a promise made by God to Abraham 
I will give you the land of your sojournings, the land of Canaan, to you and your seed after you as an eternal possession. And it was confirmed by the prophets hundreds of years later. After the Holocaust, this was a broken people pouring into the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Poor in spirit, mournful, hungry for justice, not a friend in the world, but a people which had nothing to lose. The state of Israel has done amazingly. In the annals of history, this fledgling nation has become a world leader in record speed, a mighty nation with a mighty military and a robust economy. The state of Israel is inventing new technologies every day. If you go up and down the coast from Haifa to Tel Aviv, there's tech startups all up and down the coast. Given some freedom, Jews tend to do well, tend to prosper, and then haters rise up who want to take it away. And this is what we see in Israel over the last 70 years. A nation that keeps prospering. A nation that doesn't want to hurt anybody. That wants to be a blessing to mankind. But haters got to hate. And haters who hate the Jews are motivated by this bizarre uh, motive that can only be explained as some kind of envy. And it's the, this ideology of anti-Semitism is an ideology of losers. Because rather than look to the example of what God has blessed and be drawn to it, rather than look to the light and be drawn to the light, there are some people in the world that want to snuff it out instead. Does that make sense? Someone will always say, oh, he's just saying that because he's a Jew. Well, that's not true. <laughs> and I know many of you here tonight who are not Jewish by birth would say exactly what I just said because you know it. There are always these haters that rise up who want to take it away. God's grace is amazing. He makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, his reign to fall on the just and the unjust. God loves all mankind. But anti-Semitism is a strange thing. And oftentimes, I think the Jewish nation represents the Word of God in living color. And as Matthew 5.11 says, Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Or we could say, on account of the Word of God. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For the same way they persecuted the prophets, who were before you. This is that same principle of love your neighbor as yourself because God loves everyone. He makes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust. Well, we miss out we miss out on the grace, on the blessedness, on the happiness when we allow hate to cause us to hate. And this is what is so important about Yeshua's teachings, uh, his teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. When you consider 
this idea. Bless those who hate you. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. We're being asked to follow a law that is, is totally contrary to it's totally contrary to human nature. It's it's something that I think that the world would scoff at. That the world would say, that's ridiculous. But Yeshua says, pray for those who hate you. This is all from the Sermon on the Mount. Bless those who persecute you. When your enemy slaps you on the cheek, instead of punching back, turn the other cheek and offer it. How can anyone do this? And as I said, no one can completely. But the more that we can, the more blessed we are. And the moments that we're tested most is when we're hated and reviled and persecuted by haters. The Reverend Martin Luther King formed an entire movement in the 60s based on nonviolent resistance he said much of what he learned in forming this movement was from Mahatma Gandhi who himself learned it according to him from the book of Matthew being a student of the New Testament via the British who ruled in India and he was a lawyer as well he took the Sermon on the Mount used its principles to overthrow the British and imperial rule and lead India to freedom. But he suffered brutally. <laughs> Gandhi was beaten and imprisoned. And Martin Luther King uh, went through plenty of that as well and was assassinated at a young age. So yeah, occasionally great men come along and prove that these principles can work up to a point, but who can live by them? Not many. And I feel that that Yeshua's teaching, he's, he's not telling people to embrace suffering. He's not telling people to seek suffering. He's telling us how to overcome it. We overcome hate. We overcome it with love. There's a place and a reason and a purpose for martyrdom. But the teaching from the Mount is not to desire that. There's enough suffering, hatred, and misery in the world that no one needs to seek it out. And I think that these, uh, these few examples as the two I cited are, are extremities and not what's expected of ordinary people in order to live the, the blessed and happy life. I think sometimes people look at those kinds of examples and say, ah, this is bogus. No one can do that. It's not worth it. I don't want to go and get beat up and imprisoned and, and assassinated at a young age, you know, obviously. But listen to this. Robert Bowers, last Shabbat, burst into a synagogue in the Squirrel Hill section of Pittsburgh. Squirrel Hill is uh, one of the most culturally rich and traditional Jewish neighborhoods in all of North America. He burst into a synagogue called Tree of Life with one motive, to kill Jews and to kill Jews for no reason other than the fact that they are Jews. It's difficult to understand the mind of such a tormented, twisted soul that would kill innocent people in cold blood. How can anyone hate that much? But he chose to take out his anger in life upon Jews because he saw Jews as a success. And that made him angry. Anti-Semitism is the ideology of a loser. It's the mind of a man 
who shouted, all Jews must die. And open fire on unarmed Jewish people, many of whom were elderly, gathered on Shabbat to worship in a synagogue. All Jews must die, shouted the man, as he was cornered by the police, shooting four of them also. All Jews must die, he shouted, when taken into custody and ushered by law enforcement across the street to nearby Allegheny Memorial Hospital. And upon arrival at the hospital again, all Jews must die, shouted Bowers, and in walks a physician. Hello, I'm Dr. Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> In this perfect twist of irony is so perfectly illustrated the outright stupidity of anti-Semitism, an ideology of hate directed against the people for no reason other than their success as a people. And, and there is no perfect people on the earth and the Jewish people are no exception. If I may say this in my totally biased opinion, the Jews have contributed more to the good of humanity than any other people. Beginning with Yeshua, beginning with the Bible, beginning with the, the gospel that Jews brought to the rest of the world. Then we could go on to all the, the contributions to medicine and science and art and literature and on and on. Go see for yourselves if you don't know how many Nobel Peace Prizes in the last hundred years have been won by Jews. This is why anti-Semitism is unique among all forms of hatred because typically it is, it is coming from the mind of people who Really, in hating Jews, they hate civilization itself. They, they attack Jews, they attack humanity itself. Dr. Jeffrey Cohen, who is also the president of the hospital, Algeny Memorial, was personally connected to Tree of Life Synagogue, being himself a member. He personally knew nine of the victims of the massacre. The hospital is so close to the synagogue that Dr. Cohen actually heard the gunshots from the hospital. He had every conceivable reason to be appalled, shocked, outraged with this insane murderer. In addition to Dr. Cohen, two of the other staff members who treated Bowers when he arrived at the hospital were Jewish. The attending emergency room doctor and a nurse whose father is a rabbi, Robert Bauer's worst nightmare. It almost makes you want to say, welcome to hell, Mr. Bowers. You're about to be treated kindly and humanely by Jews, the very people you tried to kill are saving your life. Your worst nightmare. Because you know how you overcome evil with good. It may not change him, but it's healing to the ones who do it. Sometimes it changes him too. I don't know. We can only do our part. And it isn't easy. And it wasn't easy for Dr. Cohen or the other two to treat this man humanely and kindly. And that was Yeshua's teaching on the mount. He said it different ways. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Resist not evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, when, you, when you're good to someone who's really mean and nasty, it's like putting hot coals on their head, even though you didn't mean it that way. 
overcome evil with good. So the story goes on. As this demented and wounded man who just murdered a slew of Jewish people in cold blood at the synagogue across the street went on declaring all Jews must die, Dr. Cohen said to Bowers, we're not here to judge you. We're not here to ask, do you have insurance or do you not have insurance? We're here to take care of people that need our help. Cohen's simple and unapologetic description of how Bowers came to be treated fairly and impartially by the very people he hates and had murdered is difficult to grasp. But I'm saying it's the reason that people who hate Jews hate Jews. It's that very humane, <coughs> decent, and kind treatment. As Yeshua taught, that people are blessed. And the haters hate the ones who are blessed. And they'll accuse the blessed, they'll accuse the happy of having stole it in some way, as to having acquired it in some wrong way. And like Cain, who slew his brother, God said to Cain, if you do well, you'll find favor also, just like your brother, but instead he killed his brother. God is speaking to the whole world right now. He's speaking about Israel. This is the time to favor Zion. Praise God. To love your neighbor as yourself, even your enemy. What that looks like, exactly, it isn't easy to say. I think that illustration of Dr. Cohen that I just gave you is a fine example. It isn't easy to say. And when we're faced with it in a big way or a small way, it isn't easy. I've struggled with it all week. And I know some of you have. And I know people out there in our community. And there's anger, and there's blame, and there's an election on Tuesday, and everybody's pointing fingers. Some people are blaming the president, which is the most absurd thing that I've ever heard. Some people are blaming uh, the other party. Everybody's pointing fingers. Everybody wants to win the election. And there's a lot of confusion, a lot of hate. And the greatest sermon ever, love your neighbor as yourself, even those who hate you, even your enemy. And uh, as I said, I don't know what that always looks like, but turn the other cheek is not about letting yourself be a doormat. There's a reason why we have Officer Mike back there, for example. I mean, we ain't stupid. We know that there's some sick people out there. You see, to love your fellow man doesn't mean to be stupid. When the state of Israel has the opportunity to sit with its enemies at a table and negotiate peace, they'll sit at table and negotiate peace or at least try. But I'm telling you something, especially with, with Prime Minister Netanyahu, Israel will not sit at that table and negotiate from weakness. They will sit and negotiate from a position of strength. That's wisdom. But they will sit and try to make peace. We can learn a lot from the way that Israel, the state of Israel, behaves, surrounded by enemies. And as I said, it's not about being stupid. It's not about letting yourself be a doormat. It's not about being weak. The one thing that I can say that it is about is I will not let someone else's hatred turn me 
into a hater. Amen. Don't let hate make you become hateful. My values are what they are. You know, I mean, I'm going to do what I'm committed to do. Just like Dr. Cohen was committed to be a doctor, to help people, to heal people. And when he was presented with the most impossible situation, he just went right on being who he is. He went right on being a doctor. And that's the way we have to be. To forgive and to bless and pray even for hateful people doesn't mean that we don't oppose hate. And as I said, I won't return hate with more hate, but that's not to say I won't oppose you if you're hateful. I will oppose you. I will oppose hate, but I will not hate you. I will not return hate with hate. I hope that makes sense to you. Because that's the only way we can understand this teaching that says to love everyone, to see all mankind as our family, as our brothers. Even when we think about what I could only describe as the lowest scum, a man like Robert Bowers, who murdered a bunch of people in cold blood, It doesn't do any good to become hateful, but it does a lot of good to oppose the kind of people and the kind of groups that a man like that belongs to. So that's the message of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a hard message, but it's, it's a message of love and it's a message of truth, and that's where the power and the glory and the kingdom is for all who will follow it will be blessed and have peace. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Praise the Lord. And thank you for coming tonight.